Kantian deontology. Suppose that all moral theories are attempts to answer this question. What is the true moral theory? And the answer will start off by saying, well, the true moral theory says to do something. And I think the most fundamental branch between uh, moral theories are those who say, let's maximize the good and those who say, let's respect something. Now, under the good maximizing views, we have seen that one of them is egoism. Egoism says, maximize your own good. And you can think about consequentialism as another type of maximizing ethic that says maximize the good, not, not for yourself, but maximize the overall good. Now, as we have talked about, the overall good is a very vague way of putting it. There are complexities about how that good should be distributed, whether we should be maximizing total good, whether we should be maximizing average utility, et cetera. But for our purposes, it's enough to say that it's some, somehow an overall good for which your personal good is included, but just is included no more or less than anybody else's good. On the other side here, we have a respect-based theory. And uh, the first one that we will talk about is a theory that says what we ought to respect, what we ought to honor is rational autonomy. And that is Kantian deontology. Let's talk about the non-consequentialist outlook. Generally speaking, a non-consequentialist theory is one that advances a theory of right action that is not based upon achieving good outcomes. So as I put it in the last slide, a non-consequentialist theory is one that says to respect something, not to maximize something. If I respect, say, justice, or if I respect human lives, I won't do an injustice or murder somebody in order to maximize occurrences of justice or to minimize the occurrences of murder. If on the other hand, I want to maximize justice or if I want to uh, maximize human lives or something like that, then I will do an injustice or I will murder some people in order to maximize justice or to minimize murders. Here's Kant. Those are his dates. And in your textbook, Russ Schaefer Landau spends two chapters on Kant because Kant was indeed one of the greatest moral thinkers that ever lived, whether you agree with him or not. And you will see much of what I called the moral concept in our first lecture in Kantian teachings. Let's talk about the good and the right. In the readings on utilitarianism, we saw how utilitarianism was not only a philosophy about what we ought to do, which is a philosophy of right, of moral rightness. In the case of utilitarianism, it was consequentialism. It said that what the right thing to do is, is to maximize the good. But utilitarianism was also a philosophy of the good, which was that the good is some type of human well-being, understood oftentimes in terms of pleasure. So we must keep those two things separated in our mind. Are we talking about what's good or are we talking about what's right? So recall how Plato, according to me, was a sophisticated egoist. He understood the right, how we should act no matter what in terms of the good. What is truly a good life? And Aristotle too was a type of egoist, I think, who combined uh, this with his natural law view. According to Aristotle, how you should act no matter what which we may understand as his theory of right, was to live according to human uh, purposes, which for him was the good life. That is his theory of the good. We haven't talked about Buddhism, but Buddhism's moral teachings as well emphasize the role of happiness. One cannot be happy unless one ceases to desire, according to Buddhism, and that forms the centerpiece of Buddhist ethics. During the Middle Ages, many Jewish, Christian, and Muslim theologians also understood morality in terms of either fulfilling our nature or obeying God's command so that we can be rewarded in heaven and punished in hell. Either way, there is a tight connection here between 
the good for somebody and what that person should do. But Kant, I think, did the most at decoupling the right from the good. What you should do, according to Kant, is a completely different question from what would be good for you or any consequences whatsoever. In fact, like many non-consequentialists, Kant thought that the right actually determines the good. So it isn't that we figure out what we should do by figuring out what's good. In fact, the arrow goes the opposite direction from Kant. We figure out what is good by first figuring out what is right. Here's one case that makes that point powerfully, I think. Do you think pleasure is good? Most of us would say yes. Most of us would say that a world with more pleasure is better than a world with less pleasure. That pleasure is something that makes the world a better place. But if that's true, then a rapist, while he's doing the raping and getting pleasure from it, the world is a little bit better for his pleasure. Of course, of course, the suffering of his victim makes it worse. But nonetheless, his pleasure does go on the scales. If he's really, really super being pleased by it, and the victim isn't being too discomforted by it, it's going to be hard for a utilitarian to explain why that's wrong to do. But you probably think it is still wrong to do. And moreover, you don't think the world is a better place because of his pleasure. You think his pleasure even makes it worse. His pleasure is a negative on the world, not a, not a positive, not a point in, in this world's favor. So Kant would agree with you on that. Kant would say, indeed, the pleasure of the rapist makes the world worse. In fact, maybe the suffering of an unjust person makes the world better. So you can't go around just saying, oh, this is a good thing. Oh, this is a bad thing. Completely detached from the morality, the moral context of that thing. The rightness of an action, the moral correctness of a state of affairs is what determines what's good or bad within it. Okay, let's start over. Here are two tests that people use when they're thinking about what's right and wrong. Here's a test. What if everybody did that? And, you know, that seems to work well when you think of actions that violate coordinating principles. Like, what if everybody just ran red lights? What if everybody cut in line? What if everybody talked during the movie? So if everyone talked at movies, um, you wouldn't even want to go to the movies anymore. So therefore, you should not talk at movies. Think also about this test, the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That seems to work well when everyone wants the same things and especially wants the right things and especially when they don't expect much from others, but it does seem to fail in other contexts. Let's take a look. What if everyone did that? Well, there's weaknesses to this test. Should I not become a scientist? Because if everyone became a scientist, there would be no farmers because there would be no plumbers, and we need farmers, and we need plumbers, and we need teachers. But if everyone became a scientist, um, we wouldn't have any of those things and the world would fall apart. So therefore, I shouldn't be a scientist. Well, that's, that seems like it's a ridiculous conclusion. What if everyone went to your house for Thanksgiving? Wow, that would be a disaster. Eight billion people at your mom's house for Thanksgiving. Okay, think about it. Think of what, what, where, where do you put the porta potties? Okay, but obviously, that is a bad, bad uh, application of that principle. So we have to be careful about applying these principles. How about the golden rule? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I wish Bill Gates would give me some money. Okay. Now insert the golden rule. I should do to Bill Gates as I would have him do unto me. So I should give Bill Gates some money. That seems, that seems odd. How about this one? I wish Nicki Minaj would jump my bones. I should do unto others as I would have them do unto me. So therefore, I should jump Nicki Minaj's bones. So that doesn't seem to work either. So um, the golden rule um, is not 
a surefire principle to follow in figuring out what we should do. Why do we like these tests? Is that they say, don't do things that you wouldn't want other people to do in some sense. And there is a certain wisdom in that. But how do we capture that wisdom? Well, Kant thought that you could think of morality in terms of categorical imperatives. And, in, in an, and an imperative is just a command, like shut the door. Now, most imperatives are what Kant called hypothetical imperatives. And a hypothetical imperative is something you must do if you want some goal. So, for instance, if your coach says shoot the ball like this or block that linebacker, or if your financial advisor says diversify your investments, or if somebody tells you go to college or eat your, sp eat your spinach, they're telling you to do things on the assumption that you want something. So if you like want to score, you should shoot the ball like this. If you want to win the game, you should block that linebacker. If you don't want to lose all your money, then you should diversify your investments. If you want to have a professional career, then you should go to college. If you want to be healthy, then you should eat your spinach. All these imperatives, as one philosopher put it, hang at the end of an if. If you want some good thing, then you should do these things. But some imperatives, categorical imperatives, do not hang at the end of an if. Some of these imperatives you must do whether or not you want anything at all. No matter what your inclinations are, no matter what your goals are, no matter what your desires or preferences are, you must do them. And candidate imperatives like that would be don't steal or don't intentionally kill innocent people or don't lie to get ahead, etc. Right? So we generally don't let somebody off the hook if they fail to do these things just because they aren't interested in being moral. If someone steals, we don't say, hey, you just stole some, You just stole that. And then they say, oh, yeah, but I, yeah, I don't, I, I don't really care about uh, being moral. We don't, we don't give a damn whether or not they care about being moral. Now contrast that with someone who's like, you, you tell them, okay, hold, you know, hold the basketball like this when you shoot. And they're like, yeah, I'm not interested in being a good free throw shooter. Well, then you just shrug your shoulders and walk away. There's nothing, there's nothing you could do if they don't want to be a good free throw shooter then they don't have to hold the ball that way. So the person uninterested in being a good free throw shooter, their interests matter. The person uninterested in um, the wrongness of stealing, um, their disinterest doesn't matter at all. We, we expect them to not steal no matter what. So the imperative don't steal is a categorical imperative. Now, as I talked about earlier, I don't love formulations like this that put morality in terms of imperatives or laws or rules. I like, I would rather principles stated as it's wrong to steal or it's wrong to intentionally kill people. But Kant liked thinking about it in terms of imperatives. All right. So before we get into Kant's um, actual moral principles, we should learn what he means by a principle. In his language for principles is maxim. A maxim is just basically the principle you're following that tells you to do the action. So it's not the particular action that must be universalizable, but the principle or maxim that you're operating under that must be universalizable. To see the difference here, consider uh, two scenarios, one where Jack hits his kid and Jill hits their kid. Uh, suppose that Jack, Jack's child wanders into the street and that makes him angry. And so he rushes to his kid and spanks his kid. In world two, Jill's kid wanders into the street and Jill runs up to her kid, spanks the kid, and tells it to get back on the lawn. So from the outsider, it looks like Jill and Jack did the same exact thing. And their action, in a sense, was the same. All right. But suppose that Jack is acting according to a principle that says, hit your kids when they make you angry. And suppose Jill is following a principle that says, hit the kids if necessary to drive home important life-saving rules. 
right? It seems like the second principle is much better than the first principle, okay? Jill's principle is a much better principle than Jack's principle. And because of that, um, it, according to Kant, Jill's action may be a good action and Jack's action may be a bad action, even though they, they, um, the actual physical aspects of the action are the same. Why? Because these two people are operating on different principles. Now that we understand what a maxim is, we can approach Kant's first pass at uh, his grand moral principle, which he calls the categorical imperative, capital C, capital I, and that goes as so. Act only according to maxims that could be willed as universal laws, as universal laws. So act only according to universalizable maxims. So you can't universalize the maxim, lie whenever you want, because if people, if, if people lied whenever they wanted, lies themselves would not be believed. It wouldn't, it wouldn't even be possible to deceive somebody. And even if in some cases, there are complexities here, by the way, having to do with some, some types of actions you wouldn't even be able to do if everybody did them. And some actions, everyone could do them, but it's not a world you would want to live in. We don't have to get into that in just the second. But basically, if everyone did it, and it would be either a horrible world if everyone did that, or it would be kind of almost self-defeating if everybody did that, then it is something you shouldn't do. Now, this seems too weak. Um, it seems like there are um, some universalizable actions that are wrong to do, but nonetheless, it is fair to say that if an action is not universalizable, then it's not moral. If you are, as it were, as Kant put it, making an exception of yourself, if you're saying, oh, I get to do it, but I wouldn't want others to do it in this same type of moral situation where all the morally relevant facts were the same, then you are making an exception to yourself and you should not do it. So this principle doesn't seem to do a good job at articulating the sufficient conditions for morality, but it may do a good job at articulating one of the necessary conditions of morality. And here's what I mean by that distinction. There are uh, some things that are necessary and some things that are sufficient for something else. So X is sufficient for Y if and only if, if you have X, then you have Y. So being a human being is sufficient for being a primate. Drinking 10 shots is sufficient for being drunk, okay? Um, but these things are not necessary. So being a human is not necessary for being a primate because you could be a primate without being a human. And likewise, you could drink 10 beers and get drunk and, and drink no shots. So drinking 10 shots is not necessary for being drunk. On the other hand, X is necessary for Y if and only if you cannot have Y without X. So for instance, oxygen is necessary for fires. Oxygen is not sufficient for fires. You need something to burn up as well, but nonetheless, oxygen is necessary for fires. If you have radioactive material, you do not have a nuclear bomb. Radioact radioactive material is not sufficient for a nuclear bomb. However, radioactive material is necessary for a nuclear bomb. Okay, so just because something is sufficient for another thing, it doesn't mean it's necessary. And just because something is necessary for something else doesn't mean it's sufficient. So going back here, um, universalizability is not sufficient for an actions being morally permissible, but it is plausibly necessary for it to be morally permissible. So for instance, everyone should kill themselves immediately seems universalizable, but that seems like an absurd moral principle. Okay, a much better version of his categorical imperative. He thought they were all sort of saying the same thing different ways, but they're not. Uh, a, di a better principle that Kant gives is the principle of humanity. And this is the one that philosophers focus the most on. 
And it goes as so, always treat humanity as an end, never as a means only. All right, so what does that mean? To treat something as a means is to treat it as a mere tool for satisfying your purposes. And obviously a tool is only as valuable as the end for which it is used. So treating something as an end, on the other hand, means treating it as the intrinsically valuable thing we use various means to get. We all go to restaurants and some of you have yourselves been waiters or waitresses. And you know what it's like for someone to treat you only as a means or as a means only, as a tool, as a sort of conveyor belt between the kitchen and the diner. You know, you, you, seat, the, you seat the diner at the table and you say, hi, I'm Jill. Um, welcome to Olive Garden. Can I start you off with an appetizer? And the, the diner just stares at the menu, doesn't respond, tells you, yeah, I'll get it X, Y, and Z, and just hands you the menu without looking at your face, continues to carry on their conversation, and so forth. And uh, you don't like it. You don't like being treated that way, right? You don't like being treated like a vending machine, a walking vending machine, all right? Now contrast that with a diner who comes in and you say, hi, uh, my name is Jill. Welcome to Olive Garden. How are you guys doing today? And the diner says, hi, Jill. I'm fine. How are you doing today? And you know, when, when that happens, you know what type of person you have here, right? That person is, whether or not that person is going to give you a great tip or whatever, that person is nonetheless acknowledging in Kant speak, acknowledging your humanity. Of course, you're there to serve the, of course, you're there to serve the, the, the diner. Of course, you are there to bring them their food, take their order, make sure their meal goes well. You are there as a means for that. But critically, you are not being treated as only a means of delivering those services. You are also at the same time treated as a end, as an end, all right? And that is, you get what Kant is saying. It's not wrong to be treated as a means. It's not wrong. I, I, am, I am a means right now of teaching you philosophy. That's fine. You should treat me as a means of, 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 te of teaching you philosophy right? What you shouldn't do is treat me as a means only of serving your need to learn about philosophy. You should also treat me as an end. So what does it mean to say that you are an end? Well, Kant felt that humanity was the supreme end for which all other purposes um, serve. Why would Kant think this? Well, his argument, as I understand it, goes as so. Premise one, everything that has value has it either intrinsically, which means to say in and of itself, or only because it is valued by something with intrinsic value. And we'll call that extrinsically valuable, okay? So a hammer is extrinsically valuable. It is only valued because somebody values it. Premise two, beings with rational autonomy, and we'll talk about that in a second, beings with rational autonomy are the sources of all extrinsic value. Premise three, whatever is the source of all extrinsic value is itself intrinsically valuable. So only beings with rational autonomy have intrinsic value. So rational autonomous agents, which include humans or at least sane adult humans, are ends in two senses. First, everything else that's valuable is valuable, valuable because we value it. We are the end or end of the line explanation for what makes those things valuable. And two, everything other than us are tools for our purposes. Our purposes are the ends for which everything else is a means. We are the big kahunas. All right, so what do we mean by rational autonomy? 
Kant felt that rational autonomy made everything else valuable, so it was supremely valuable. We just saw that. Whatever is the source of all extrinsic value is intrinsically valuable, and beings with rational autonomy are the source of all extrinsic value. Now, this inference seems uh, plainly false. Uh, why should something um, be have some quality just because it makes other things um, have that quality? So a machine may make plastic parts, but that doesn't mean the machine itself is made of plastic. Likewise, just because we make things extrinsically valuable because we desire them or want them for some purpose we have, doesn't mean that we are valuable at all, okay? So um, that would need to be argued for. Maybe Kant has something to say about it. Okay, but let's go, let's return to this question about what is rational autonomy. Rationality is here understood as the ability to make plans, think abstractly, consider consequences, and figure out how to achieve goals, all right? And autonomy is the ability to choose for yourself what maxims, rules, or principles, or codes, or laws you will live by. So autonomy comes from the Greek word auto, self, and nomos, which means ruler, or law, or legislator. We legislate our own laws to ourselves. We have, we, well, or at least some of us have that ability to at least some degree. All right. So one way I like to analogize this is autonomy is being able to steer your ship. Okay. And rationality is the ability to know uh, where you should steer your ship. So being able to like read the stars and understand, you know, where you should sail your ship according to the stars. And this is your hand on the tiller steering the boat of your life, okay? So someone can be rational, but be, you know, have a good idea of what's good and bad, what sort of things one has to do, but be so addicted to drugs that they have no autonomy. They can't make themselves do what they know they should do, all right? Likewise, maybe somebody has a lot of autonomy, but, you know, they're very much in control of their ship, but they are bad at figuring out, you know, what they should do. Now, when Kant says that we are to try to be autonomous, to make up our own rules, he may sound like an anarchist of some sort, that everyone should legislate their own morality and live by those live by those rules they decide to live by. But that's uh, not the case because Kant felt that if we are all rational and autonomous, we would arrive at the same moral principles to live by. Unfortunately, we are not. Um, we, don't, we don't actually achieve full rationality or autonomy. Um, we live by, uh, we often live by uh, contradictory sets of rules. We are sometimes ruled by our passions or emotions or our emotions. And so we are often, we are sort of living by multiple laws. And that's what heteronomy is. Heteronomy is exemplified by slave life. Um, think about how slaves live according to outside rules. They do whatever the master wants, not what they want. And likewise, as going back to, to Plato's thoughts about the tripartite soul, many of us are slaves to our own selves, to our pleasures, our addictions, our fears, our compulsions, our ambitions, right? So only a person who is truly master of himself or herself will be ruled by principles that she accepts or he accepts and wants to live by. That will be an autonomous person. And humanity basically stands for that. So I don't really like how Schaefer Landau puts this. He says that Kant thought that humans were quote unquote priceless or intrinsically valuable. And that's not right. He didn't think humans are priceless or intrinsically valuable. He thought that rational autonomy was intrinsically valuable and to be supremely 
respected and honored. For instance, Kant was okay with killing in war. He felt the death penalty was obligatory. So he didn't think humans as such were supremely valuable in the sense of, oh, you uh, can't hurt them. All right. Uh, <clears throat> when Kant says the word humanity, he means it as a shorthand for rational autonomy. Kant says we are to respect the humanity in others, not humans as such. So you shouldn't respect, you know, you shouldn't respect me because I'm a primate that, you know, is this branch a primate? You should respect me because of the rational autonomy that I um, have or could have. Khan would also say, for instance, another way to understand that it's not humanity in, the, in any biological sec sense that he's interested in is to appreciate that Kant would say that non-human rational agents, such as a, a Vulcan in Star Trek like Spock, should also be respected in the same way. So the autonomous person is truly the only person who is doing what he or she wants to do. And this nice, nicely answers the puzzle about why should we be moral? Why should you be moral? Well, you should be moral because if you're autonomous, then you're going to be following the rules that you yourself decided to give yourself. If they didn't motivate you, you would not have chosen those principles in the first place. And if you're rationally autonomous, you're going to choose for yourself. No, one, no one's going to impose it upon you. You're going to choose for yourself moral principles that are the same as the ones I choose for myself if I'm rationally autonomous. So there isn't some sort of moral anarchy or relativism here where everyone lives by their own independent codes. Any rational autonomous agent will choose the same code as any other rationally autonomous agent. Okay, so um, it's true that Kant views moral authority as a social contract theorist views political authority, just as social contract theorists uh, think that the authority of the laws must rest on those who live under the laws. Kant thinks the authority of the moral law comes from the endorsement of those who live under the moral law, who place it upon themselves. So now we have more insight into why Kant thought that rational autonomy was supremely important. Rational autonomy was that feature that makes a being not merely a reactive uh, being like a stone or a tree that responds to forces placed upon it, or a being that blindly follows instinct or inclination like animals do. Only rationally autonomous beings are self-rulers. Okay, now here's an objection. If it's true that sane adult humans uniquely have rational autonomy, that's, that's an interesting feature. But what about that makes us the only intrinsically valuable things? Why is it, why is it that that why is that so much more valuable than, say, being able to fly like an eagle can, or to be camouflaged like a cuttlefish can, or to follow scents really well as a dog can? What is it about this interestingly unique superpower of humans that makes us so important and those things not? That's a deep question that we won't get into just now. Kant offered a third formulation of his categorical imperative. It goes as so, act in accordance with the maxims of a legislator, giving universal laws for a kingdom of ends. In other words, imagine you and all other rationally autonomous beings, that is to say ends in Kant speak, are the ultimate authorities in the universe, a sort of kingdom in which everybody is a congressperson. The maxims you live by are those maxims you think such a body would endorse. So the general idea here is that you must respect everybody's rational autonomy. You must honor everybody's rational autonomy. You are not trying to maximize rational autonomy. You're not trying to just 
make more rationally autonomous beings, like maybe a consequentialist would who felt rational autonomy was the good. Rather, we are respecting rational autonomy, honoring rational autonomy in others and critically ourselves. We'll talk about that in a bit. So you are treating the rational autonomy of others as an inviolable constraint on what you may do to them and yourself. And you respect rational autonomy um, by constraining yourself to rules which every rational autonomous agent would endorse. Let's talk about the importance of acting according to moral duty, according to Kant. For Kant, merely doing the right thing isn't the key. The key is doing the right thing for the right reasons. Obviously, sometimes people do the wrong thing, like say when Jack beats his wife, that's obviously immoral. But sometimes people do the right thing, but for the wrong reason. For instance, say Jack doesn't beat his wife, but he doesn't beat his wife because he doesn't want to go to jail. Jack's non-abuse of his wife is also not morally correct. Jack is just doing the right thing for the wrong reasons. Kant gives this good example of a shopkeeper who accidentally overcharges a client who doesn't realize it and the client walks away. The shopkeeper then runs after the client and gives uh, the, the correct amount of change back. Okay. This, this sort of thing actually happened, of course, uh, with uh, Abraham Lincoln. There's a famous example of a Abraham Lincoln, you know, walking miles and miles to return two cents that he had overcharged a customer. So if the shopkeeper returns the extra money that he doesn't need to out of inclination, just because he's a nice guy, it's not a morally praiseworthy act to Kant. If he does it because he's in a good mood, nope. Not, still not a morally praiseworthy act. If he thinks, look, it's good business. If somehow this guy finds out that I overcharged him, word will get out that I keep people's money. It's bad for business. It's better just uh, long, long run. I'll just make more money and have a more profitable, profitable business if I make sure that no one gets overcharged. Sure, it's good business. But that's not the right motive for returning the money it's still that that is just a selfish motive a prudential motive for returning the money or if you just like the person's face or whatever none of those are moral reasons the only the only reason that would make that act morally praiseworthy is being motivated would be because the shopkeeper is motivated to return it because he recognizes that it is his moral duty that failing to do that is treating the customer as a means to save money. Only by recognizing and honoring the customer's rational autonomy and treating him as an end would be the right motivation for returning his money. Okay. Um, another example that Kant gives is the person who doesn't commit suicide. Kant felt that it was wrong to commit suicide for reasons we'll talk about in a second. But consider the person who doesn't commit suicide only because uh, he is afraid to. Kant says that's not, that's not a, a moral reason not to commit suicide. That's not praiseworthy at all. That's just not doing something that you shouldn't do out of fear. Right? Rather, for Kant, the reason you shouldn't commit suicide is because you have to honor the rational autonomy in yourself and not use a means as a means to avoid suffering. So for Kant, an act is moral only if it is done out of respect for one's duty to the moral law. As we have seen, only then would it be autonomous, and only then would it properly regard other people's status as co-legislators in the kingdom's kingdom of ends, and indeed yours as well. Because for Kant, you have to honor your own rational autonomy, not just other people's. So the good person is motivated by duty only and acts well even if she doesn't want to or doesn't enjoy it or finds it troublesome, etc. In fact, a person in this condition is morally superior to a person who does the right thing out of pleasure or good naturedness. So for instance, if I don't really want to return your money, 
that I borrowed from you. But I recognize that it is my moral duty to do so and that I would be using you as a means if I borrowed money from you and didn't return it when I could. And Kant says, that Dan, that version of Dan, who grudgingly returns the money and isn't, he has to drag himself to go do it, is a better person morally than the Dan who doesn't recognize that, that you have a right to that money, but just wants to return your money and does it in a perfectly happy, good-natured way. All right, Because that second person, although, by the way, way more popular at parties, way more liked person to just have a, a good, friendly nature and so forth. But nonetheless, that person, if that person doesn't get it, if that person doesn't get that they have an obligation, a moral obligation to do so, and a moral obligation based upon your mattering intrinsically and, and, and the non-right that I have to treat you like an ATM, that person doesn't get that, their mere inclination to return the money is just no different than they're liking a sunny day as opposed to a rainy day. Okay. Now, Plato and Aristotle would disagree. They would say that you, the better person is the person who not only does the right thing, but wants to do the right thing. Okay. But for Kant, that isn't the case. The, 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 the necessary and sufficient conditions for someone's act being laudable and the person's being laudable is his or her understanding that it is their duty to do it. Nonetheless, Kant did believe in virtues. Kant did believe you should want to do the right thing, but nonetheless, it doesn't redound to the moral quality of the act. Okay, let's look at some applications of Kantian philosophy that Kant himself talks about. And in this discussion, I want you to think about, and in this discussion, I want you to separate two things. I want you to separate Kant's application of his moral theory from his moral theory. Because maybe his moral theory is right, but he's not applying it very well. Let's think about Kant's view about being a prostitute. Kant felt that you cannot morally hire a prostitute. He felt that you cannot morally view pornography. Since he thinks doing these things would be using people as mere means, using them as tools for sexual gratification, and it would not respect their rational autonomy. So does that seem true to you? Well, I mean, obviously many sex, quote unquote, sex workers are in fact sex slaves, sort of sex trafficked people, pimped out women and so forth. And uh, I think we would agree that um, that's immoral to hire somebody who is a sex slave and to support the sex slavery or sex trafficking uh, industry. But what about uh, a sex worker who's not a sex slave or prostitute who's not a sex slave? Why must it be the case that you would be using that person as a means only, as a mere tool for sexual gratification? What is the difference? If, if you, many of you have been to masseuses and you go in and you disrobe and you, you know, you tell the masseuse, you give the masseuse some directions of what to do or where it hurts or whatever. And the masseuse goes to work on your back and you're chatting about life, you know, you're chatting about kids, you chat about the weather, you know, you're treating, obviously the masseuse is there to serve you. The masseuse you are treating as a means, but you are also treating the masseuse as an end by respecting his or her humanity, treating them with dignity, even though they're serving you. So if that's possible, what, what is impossible about uh, the same thing happening in a situation with um, a, a, a prostitute? But nonetheless, Kant would say it is, you know, he, he just had a, a hard time thinking that you would be honoring somebody's rational autonomy to treat them also as a prostitute. By the way, Kant felt that it was 
thus immoral to let yourself become a prostitute. So Kant would say he was a very rigorous, morally rigorous um, man. So he believed that in all these things, right, that if it's truly wrong to do, that you must not do it, no matter what the consequences. So if, if you're starving to death, unless you um, could get money by prostitution, then just starve to death. Um, if your only choices are starvation or prostitution, just starve. It's not immoral to starve to death. It is immoral to use yourself as a means. Now, this is critical for me that you guys get this because it's very different than the contractarian viewpoint, which says you may do whatever you want with yourself, that you have complete sovereignty over yourself. Kant did not think that. Kant felt you not only had to respect the humanity of others, but the, humani the humanity in yourself. You had to honor that. And you dishonor it, he felt, by prostituting yourself. Okay? And you don't dishonor it by just starving to death. But again, you have to wonder, how do I dishonor myself by being a prostitute? How do I treat myself merely as a means? He would say, you're just using your, you're using yourself as just a means for money, not also as an end if you sell yourself for money. But the prostitute may say, I'm not selling myself for money. I'm performing a service for clients, just like the masseuse does. Okay, just like a dancer does. Just like a musician does. I am performing for, for a client. And uh, there's no reason why I have to dis disrespect myself when I do it. Or allow myself to be disrespected when I do it. Um, you know, so this is, this is, you know, perhaps Kant, well, no, I mean, it doesn't, it, it's not hard to see that Kant is coming from a place that viewed sex as profoundly intimate, profoundly tied up with your, uh, he didn't, you know, not a culture that took sex as like a sort of, in a matter of fact way, right? Uh, a very uh, rigorous Lutheran German tradition here. And so for him, he had a hard time imagining that somebody could be a prostitute and still be respecting themselves or that someone could hire a prostitute and, and be respecting the prostitute. But maybe, maybe that isn't the case, right? Maybe he's just misapplying his own principle. What about suicide? Kant felt that you cannot commit suicide. Um, because what you're doing is using yourself as a means, namely to uh, relieve the misery of life, to escape the misery of life. And by killing yourself, you're disrespecting your own rational autonomy. So suppose there's some, some other person who's driving you nuts. Suppose Jack makes you miserable. And so you're like, God, oh, Jack is driving me crazy. Every time he's around, I'm just Every time I look at his face, I just want to beat it. Make, whenever he's around, I'm sad. I'm just going to kill Jack and escape the misery that Jack imposes on my life. Well, I think you guys get that that would be wrong, that that'd be using Jack as a means to um, relieve your misery, not treating him also as an end. Not honoring Jack, Jack's humanity. But uh, what importantly differs when that person who's driving you crazy is the person in the mirror? All right, so you drive yourself crazy. So you uh, are disgusted with yourself. So you can't stand yourself, All right? You have no more right to kill yourself, Kant thinks, than you have a right to kill uh, somebody else who, who is making you feel the same way. But again, is this Kant misapplying his theory or does his theory really dem demand, this, demand that? Would legislators in a kingdom of ends allow suicide in some cases? Would, um, is it the case that every time somebody commits suicide, they are, uh, as it were, disrespecting the humanity in themselves, treating themselves only as a means? Maybe not. Kant felt that masturbation was wrong on these grounds. He felt that you are using yourself as a means for pleasure. You're treating yourself like your own private amusement park for pleasure. And you shouldn't um, disrespect 
yourself by treating yourself as a means only for pleasure. But again, why can't somebody masturbate while also respecting themselves? Okay, that's an interesting challenge. Self-slavery self is another case. Um, so suppose you're poor and you'd like a nicer house, you'd like better food, a safer neighborhood, better education for your kids, etc. And a billionaire offers you millions of dollars to be his slave. And this quote unquote slavery involves bringing him shoes, his shoes every morning. And that's it. But you cannot quit if you accept it. And uh, you only have to be at work eight hours a day and then you can retire in 10 years. Is this immoral? And Kant would say that even the mildest form of slavery is immoral to accept since that would be disrespecting your autonomy. Is, it, is that true? Would this deal be disrespecting your autonomy? Likewise with the reformation of convicts. So suppose Jack keeps going to jail, jail for stealing cars. Should we subject Jack to some sort of conditioning that trains him not to steal cars like hypnotism, say if hypnotism worked? And Kant would say, believe it or not, no. No, and, and I think you could probably see why once you think about it for a bit. You cannot hypnotize Jack to, to condition him not to steal cars because that would disrespect his rational autonomy. You can't condition people or brainwash people right? You can try to persuade them by giving them reasons, but you can't do an end run around their rational autonomy and just try to control them like autom automatons. Let's talk about love potions. Suppose Jill loves Jack and suppose Jack doesn't love Jill. Jill begs Aphrodite for a love potion and Aphrodite gives Jill some. And let's suppose Jill knows, I mean, she really knows, she really knows that if she slips some of the love potion to Jack, into Jack's coffee, he will love her as much as he could love anybody. And let's also suppose that Jack would be utterly delighted with Jill, who would love Jack back and they'd have a great life and live happily ever after. Should Jill give Jack the love potion. And quite plausibly, Jack would be happier, right? Jack would be happier if Jill gave him the love potion. Let's suppose Jack is about to marry Beth, who's going to ruin his life. You know, we look into a crystal ball and we see that this is true. Should Jill give Jack the love potion? Would it be permissible for Jill to give Jack the love potion? Kant would say clearly no. No, because this would disrespect Jack's autonomy. You cannot just hijack somebody's um, life. All right? You could persuade Jack. You could try to give him the evidence, but you can't treat him as a mere tool for your means or for your ends, even if your ends are his happiness. Okay, so even if your end is Jack's happiness and you're not in it for yourself, you're disrespecting Jack's rational autonomy by, by forcing him to do what will make him happy. So to sum up, by the time we get to the principles of humanity and the kingdom of ends formulations of the category core. So to sum up, what we learn from the kingdom of ends formulations of the categorical imperative and the humanity, the principle of humanity formulation of the categorical imperative, we, so to sum up these last two, <clears throat> so to sum up these last two principles, the principle of humanity and the kingdom of end formulations, help us see that Kant's view is all about respecting people, even if they don't respect themselves. And respecting them by refusing to do anything to them that 
disrespects their rational autonomy, not respecting them in the sense of, oh, you treat them nice. Because again, he believed in death penalty. He believed that it was okay to fight in war, right? It's not about treating them gently. It's about treating them in a way that respects their rational autonomy. And critically, this all applies to yourself too. You cannot morally do things that undermine your own autonomy. 